Hello, and welcome to another episode of Five Alarm Task Force. I'm your host, Steve Green. Happy to be here with you. Happy to have you here with us. Now, this is new if you're just watching the video. If you've been listening to the audio, well, you heard our introduction before. My guest today is a returning guest. He's Though we've never met, I'm proud to say we are still friends. We have a number of connections that make us friends. But it is Dr. Gamaliel Bear. And let me tell you a little bit about him. He joined the Howard County Fire Department of Fire and Rescue Services in 2008. From 2008 until 2018, he served as a f- in the field as a firefighter EMT. He spent five years at the busiest engine company and five years with special ops. While in special ops, he developed an underwater remotely operated vehicle, or UROV, program. The team has been used for regional responses and has conducted four body recoveries since so it was launched in 2017. It's interesting. I didn't realize it was Howard. I thought it was a different co- county. But back in 2000, when we were in the greater Washington area for uh, the first, we were in Baltimore for the, the Firehouse Expo. And then we came to Baltimore for the uh, emergency na- American tour where they fixed up the uh, Squad 51 and they were taken across the country. And then from there, we went and spent a day with, I forget which station, but Howard County, I think it was 11, Howard County Station 11. Yeah, we had a great, good number of calls and it was great filming with them and stuff like that. We had a lot of fun there. In January of 2018, during his doctoral studies, he was invited to serve at the Howard County Fire and Rescue Headquarters, where he launched the department's health and wellness program. As a certified health coach, a certified personal trainer, and a credentialed peer supporter, he led the peer fitness program and the peer support program and taught health and wellness in the fire academy. That's great. I mean, that's outstanding. While at headquarters, he led the peer support team through the department's first career line of duty death. In the summer of 2020, he returned to the field, but continues to teach and consult on health and wellness for both individuals and organizations. Since 2017, Dr. Beer has volunteered as a National Fallen Firefighters Foundation state advocate. He represents the NFFF both locally and nationally in fire service education and advocacy, as well as special projects development. He was a founding member of the Permanent Public Safety Health and Wellness Support Group for the state of Maryland. He has delivered education and presentations at the local, state, and national level as keynote speaker, breakout room speaker, and panelist. He continues to participate in podcasts, thankfully, and webinars. Since 2012, Dr. Bear served as a Coast Guard reservist. He enlisted as an intelligence specialist in 2016 and received his commission as an officer. He served as an emergency preparedness liaison officer known as an EPLO, to FEMA's National Response Coordination Center, and was activated during the triple hurricanes of 2017, where he helped to coordinate critical life safety missions for Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. He is now an intelligence officer at the U.S. Coast Guard Intelligence Coordination Center, which is the Coast Guard Strategic Intelligence Analysis and Production Center. And if you're a fan of uh, NCIS, they recently had a a, a repeated episode where there was an NCIS from the Coast Guard Service, working with good old Mr. G- uh, the, I'm sorry, Agent Gibbs. Dr. Bear is currently work, what has worked on two book projects, and now one has come out, correct? One is published? Uh, it's, it's, it's being printed now, I guess, almost. Uh, it's done. It's just not printed yet, but okay, we're almost there. We're almost there on health and wellness for the fire service. He's been married for 17 years to Dr. Nan Bear, uh, who is a has a doctoral uh, of pharmacy. They have three, they have four children. He holds a BS in marketing from the University of Maryland, College Park, an MS in management from John Hopkins University, and a doctor of education in organizational change and leadership from the University of Southern California, where he earned the dissertation of the year award. In March of 2020, he received his chief training officer designee from CPSE. He is a mentor to doctoral students at the University of Southern California, to firefighters and his, in his department, and the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation advocates around the nation. G, it's a pleasure to have you back. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. Um, I guess since the last time we did that uh, very long <laughs> intro, just a couple of corrections. Uh, one is that um, I still work for Howard County Fire and Rescue, so um, but I am in. Uh, I'm on orders right now with the Coast Guard. Um, and so, um, 
spending a lot of time down in DC now. Um, and then uh, Nan and I just had our 20th anniversary this year, actually. So. Uh, muzzle tough. Congra- congratulations. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, and the book should be out soon. If everything's done, um, I'm sure we'll uh, we'll be in touch about that. But um, right now, we're just waiting for fire engineering to print it. So. Great, great. Well, let's uh, let's take take uh, what you just said, and let's remember the uh, the life and the dedication and the service of Chief Bobby Hall to May rest in peace for everything he did for this fire service. One of our great leaders, that's for sure. That's for sure. Okay. All right, so. Uh, we had a little discussion, folks, before we started recording about the, the the topic we're going to cover. And while it could be very, very technical, in about 40 minutes, we kind of really mashed it out and came up with a great way of applying what Dr. Bear is going to talk about. Now, we call him G because that's his nickname, uh, was a way to a better way for us to look at the fire service, not just today, but for tomorrow, because we know that we don't have the luxury of waiting around for tomorrow because we live for the day with what we do. When we're on shift, that's what we do. It's the firehouse. It's what we do in that department. If you're a volunteer, when you make your commitment to go to a call, that's it. That's what you're thinking about. You focus on that. But what about the person themselves? What about the whole person? We don't just hire robots to be firefighters. If we did, G would be out of a job. So, it, you know, over 300,000 of our, of our career firefighters at the IAFF, we don't want that to happen. But what we do need is a way to increase and see a better picture of the people in the fire service. Because sometimes we don't look far enough. And it's not just a fire service, by the way. I mean, we know this in business. M- many businesses, they give you a paper, you fill it out, and that's, or you send in your resume, and that's it. That's all they look at. And they say yes, no, and most of the time it's no, and occasionally there's a yes. We can't do that anymore. We wouldn't want to be treated that way, and we shouldn't treat others that way. So what G and I came up with is a way for the need for the diversity of the mind, body, and soul of an applicant or an interested person in fire service for the fire service, instead of just looking at a quick written test or just a resume. I mean, I'm a perfect example. I walked into a fi- volunteer fire, well, I didn't even know it was volunteer. I walked into a fire station, look at the apparatus. Next thing I know, I walk out, walk out with an application. And I never will look back with anything but love for what I did for those eight years. It was important to me. But I didn't know a hoot about the fire service other than I liked apparatus. But I didn't know anything about it. But I was accepted. Now, one reason I know, because the chief said it was, because I was a college graduate. And they had never had a college graduate in the department before. But I said to him, that doesn't make me a firefighter, sir. I'm just a kid off the street. I can't even change my own oil in my car. I can fill up my car. I can check the oil. I can fill up the wiper fluid. I can't do anything else. He says, don't worry, son. We're going to teach you. Now, if every fire department just took that little vignette to heart, and what this chief said to me way back in 77, with his southern drawl, that was sometimes very difficult to understand, but said to me, don't worry, we'll take care of you. They did. The training was great in the department. Then I was sent to regional and state training and finished three state courses in basic firemanship, engineer, hydraulics, and high-level rescue, which wasn't bad for a kid who suffered from macrovolvia since he was five years old. So they saw something in me, even though I had no background in the fire service, that said I might be worth value to them. We're not doing that, are we, anymore? Really? 
Uh, is that, isn't that the missing link? Yeah, I think, um, I think there's, uh, there's a, uh, an effort right now in the fire service to, um, going to have to just roll with me here, Steve, because I'm going to um, say things that might trigger some people. But I think there's an effort to tokenize every industry to some degree. And um, and we're in this phase where, uh, you know, we want to make things representative of the communities that um, that we work in. But it's, it's definitely not thought of, of uh, to the level that you're explaining. We're not looking at... Um, by individuals as um, this, as you mentioned, body, mind, or soul, uh, as a whole person, um, it's it's either you're either in the paradigm where it's um, purely merit based and you're a number on a sheet, or maybe you fit the uh, the token figure that the fire service is after for that day, and um, and you know I think this discussion is about looking at. Uh, what does uh, DEI mean in the fire service and what are the different ways that you can approach doing it? And um, what is the, what is the, you know, like really root philosophy of um, you know, equity as a, as a concept, especially as that's a buzzword today. And how does that, how do you make that work in, in a fire service? Um, and actually also, how do you actionize that, I think? So, um, so yeah, this is all actually uh, for, for your listeners that are interested um, based on um, an essay that I wrote. And it's on Substack. So anyone who wants to look at uh, my Substack, you can, um, you can check out my Substack. You just Google my name, Gamaliel Bear, and put in Substack, and it should come right up. Um, the actual website is drgamalielbear.substack.com. So in this essay, I explain that um, going back to the, the first root issue, which is what is uh, what are we doing with DEI and what could we be doing better and how do you look at this um, this problem in the fire service? And so hold on, hold on I explain second. in the essay. G, could you explain just to make sure our viewers and listeners know what DEI means, please? Yeah, sure. DEI stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it has become um, quite the buzz term in the last five years, maybe 10 years, but really in the last five years, it's, it's become a big term. And what that is, is it's, it's an effort for organizations to, um, to change the way they recruit and retain. And, and how do you make an organization resemble either your local community or the national um, sort of, you know, statistical uh, group of, of different individuals that make up that nation. Um, and whatever, whatever your target is, that's the idea, that you're, you want to make your organization look like that target. And so a lot of organizations are either hiring a diversity officer or creating a DEI office to, to manage these recruitment and retention problems. And one of the biggest problems is that in the fire service, if you go to any convention these days, you'll hear that we just can't recruit or retain. So there's two issues. One is uh, whether or not people are applying to fire departments. And the other is whether or not enough people that are target audiences are applying to the fire department. Those are two different problems. Um, and there, on the, the second problem, which is whether en enough people from different backgrounds are applying to your fire service, at the end of the day, there's a, this is a numbers game that you can play and just look at whether or not you have enough applicants of a certain background in your community and, um, and just do the numbers. Uh, certain communities are made up differently. And so um, if you look at uh, Maryland, for instance, we have a pretty diverse state. You're going to get a pretty good amount of applicants from um, every background into your fire service. But depending on what part of Maryland you're in, you may have certain, like maybe only white people applying. Um, 
And that's the problem that fire departments are trying to face as they sort of compete against each other for, for diversity, if you will. And so this leads to the bigger issue, which is um, certain people will tell you that diversity and equity and inclusion, the, the core point here about equity is that um, the outcomes are the same. And the idea is that um, the organization, whether it's the fire service or another organization, will create an office and then that office will decide um, based on whatever internal metrics they're using or internal standards they're using, who to hire and who to promote uh, within the department in order to meet a goal that is uh, representative of the community that they're trying to target. So if you want to become diverse, let's just say you want a quarter of your department to be white, a quarter Hispanic, a quarter Asian, a quarter black, then what that means is the diversity and inclusion office or the HR department will set out uh, sort of quotas or recruitment goals to hit those marks. And what inevitably ends up happening is if that's what you're going to do, it becomes very hard to do that if you're only going off of, um, let's say, test scores, for instance. And there, there's reasons for that, uh, that people of different backgrounds tend to do differently on standardized test scores. That just is one of those, yep. you know, hard facts. And so if you're just going off of test scores, you end up having to choose the people who test the best. Now, there's an interesting thing here, Steve, which is if you think about uh, actually currently, um, I don't know if it's ended yet or not, but Harvard and Yale were in, involved in um, some lawsuits. They got sued by Asian student groups. And that's because it was harder for Asians to get into Harvard and Yale and other Ivy League institutes um, because of policies that Harvard and Yale put in place um, where they were favoring people of different backgrounds over Asians because Asians tend to score the best on standardized tests. And so this lawsuit has played out and the response from Harvard and Yale was basically this. We're, we're trying to create a diverse body of students in our university. And if we only take people based on their test scores and their SAT scores or their GPAs, then uh, we will have much less flexibility and, and maybe fail at making our student body diverse. So here's a sort of a, um, a, a mental uh, experiment we can play. Um, you know, China has like 1.4 billion people if in the United States our universities had no restrictions, then there's the possibility that um, China, which is one of the uh, countries in the Far East that tend to score very high on standardized tests, they could flood our best universities with all members from China, and this could actually <clears throat> impact your national security to some degree. And so uh, from that perspective, Harvard and Yale, they're – argument that they shouldn't be just confined to taking people who score the highest on tests. Uh, it's a really interesting conversation because um, at that global level, you could see a national security impact on, um, on our university system. So what they're saying is, well, we should actually be able to set a minimum standard that we're willing to accept for grades. Uh, we're not necessarily picking off the top of like 1600 SATs, if we're willing to accept 1,200 as our SAT minimum standard, that opens up the doors for who we can choose, and therefore we can then um, purposely select people that meet our minimum standards that also help us to build this diverse community of applicants that we're going for. And that concept is, I think, an appropriate concept to consider for the fire service, and in fact, that's exactly how we do executive searches for fire chiefs. When we look for fire chiefs, we say, here's the minimum standard we're looking for for a fire chief. We want to cast, we want to cast a wide enough net so that we have more than one to choose from. We'd love to end up with 10 or 15 great candidates that meet these minimum requirements. And any of, anybody who meets these minimum requirements, we are now going to make a subjective decision based on what we believe fits 
best with our organization. Does that make sense? It, it makes perfect sense. I mean, this is what well, you want. And, and you mentioned before uh, recruitment and retention. And as my good friend, uh, Chief Anthony Correa, a little north of you in Jersey, s- said to me when I was going to do my first roundtable pod- podcast, it was about recruitment and retention. He says, Steve, that's, you have it wrong. I said, why? Isn't it a problem? So goes, the problem's there. But it has to be retention and recruitment. Because if we can't keep the people we have, how the hell are we going to bring new people in? I said, Chief, I never thought of it that way. You're absolutely right. So you, you, it, it's true. I think what you said makes perfect sense. We need to look at the whole person. Uh, and again, like you said, have a minimum standard to be the baseline. And then check out everybody who everybody above that. Bring them in and and do that further analysis. Get to know them. Find out who they are. You just can't take a sheet of paper and say, "All right, this will be our next chief." I don't think that's going to work in most departments. And I think your idea or your concept for this holds a lot. Pardon again the pun for the Pfizer's, but it holds a lot of water. Because it's what we need. Yeah, so there's another piece to this, which is, um, well, there's, there's, there's multiple other pieces. One of, one of the other pieces is um, if you're going to go to a system that uh, looks at the entire person, the, the biopsychosocial or body, mind, soul uh, aspects of an individual, instead of just going off of a test score, then there has to be effective ways to value or measure or assess somebody's physical abilities, mental abilities, social or emotional abilities. And, you know, maybe some departments have advanced screening processes where they do a psychological battery uh, that, you know, in the fire service, the, the CPAT, the physical test is, is right. common. And, and maybe they use the interview as a way to assess the social or emotional aspect of a person. So, in some departments, there may already be this assessment of a of the body, mind, soul to some degree, but there's this. Uh, it, so you you need to have that in place. You need to have a way to assess those three uh, aspects of an individual. But there's this other part, which is um, in the age of DEI, in the age of diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, going back to the idea that equity is about equal outcomes. Uh, what's going on right now is that um, there is uh, there's very little transparency in how people are being selected. And it seems like at least the perception is that a small group of people in an organization are making decisions um, for who to, who to recruit or retain or promote. And when people look at how you would do a, uh, recruitment or retention or promotion based off of um, merit, uh, then what they would want to know is, okay, how did people score on these assessments of the whole person, on the body, the mind, soul assessment? Um, And are we picking people that, okay, we're all agreeing on a minimum level of uh, sort of this floor that people have to meet? Well, if we're picking person B over person A, and person A met the minimum requirements and they had this sort of profile for their body, mind, soul, but they got passed up for person B because person B fit a certain target that the, that the uh, department wanted, then the question is, what happens to person A? And right now there's no answer for that. Um, and I want to take us back to, uh, for a moment to, um, to Aristotle because what, Aristotle presented 2,500 years ago was a concept of equity that I think is relevant today for the fire service or any other organization. And most people who talk about equity today don't realize that equity was being taught by Aristotle. And he has a very different way of looking at how we're doing equity today. And I think it's valuable to understand what he said. What he said was that he, he liked the idea of equity, by the way. He said equity was actually better than justice. And what he says is that sometimes justice, um, which 
ultimately, if you can, if you can make the ultimate rule, justice would be uh, universal and timeless. That's the goal for any form of justice. For any rule would be to make a rule that's universal and timeless. That means it affects everybody universally and it stands for all time, right? That's the sort of the, the pinnacle. But not all rules reach that high bar. And so what Aristotle said was, equity is when you recognize that the rule doesn't really meet that standard, and you go outside of the rule in order to, um, to do right. And so an example of that is like this. If, um, if a fire chief and a firefighter from the department go out for lunch, the rules of society would suggest that those individuals each pay their own way. They split the bill in half or, you know, they, they pay for whatever they bought, whatever. And the fire chief, knowing that that person makes a lot more than the firefighter, might say, hey, I'll cover the bill. Even though they, the rules of society don't say the fire chief should cover the bill, the rules of society just say the bill should maybe be split or people should pay on their own. But the fire chief might say, I understand that, but I'm going to go ahead and go outside those rules because I know I make more and, you know, this will help this other, this firefighter. And it's sort of a form of charity, if you will. But what Aristotle says is in the act of doing equity, there is an exchange. So the person who receives that equity is giving back honor to the individual who gave that equity. And what that means is that there's an equation that's balanced out. So on either side of the equal sign, so you say X in math, but if you say X equals four plus two, then we know that X has to equal six, right? Yep. It's the balancing of an equation. So in equity, Aristotle says the balancing of the equation is giving the honor to the person who gave the equity. They stepped outside of the rules to do more than what was asked of them in order to help this other person. So what we're seeing right now in today's organizations is these offices of equity, diversity, diversity, equity, and inclusion standing up, and they're saying that we're going to recruit and retain in such a way to benefit people who, because of the rules and because of maybe, you know, past wrongs or even current um, lack of opportunities for certain individuals, we're going to give these people, whoever that is, an opportunity that might have otherwise not been given to them. So they're, they're doing the same concept. However, what, what's not happening is there's not a balancing of the equation. So the person who would have otherwise had the position based on whatever metric you go off of, whether it's a merit-based score off of one dimension, like a test score, or even if it's a merit-based score off of the dimensions of a whole person, so the body, mind, soul triad, whatever you're rating, if you're purposely avoiding that person to give the position or promotion to another person, then the question would be, is the equation being completed? Is the honor being given by the institution or the organization? Is there any honor being given to somebody who was passed up? And right now that's not occurring. And so you're, you're seeing within, I think the rank and file members of the fire service and other organizations as well, you know, people can become resentful, and I think that that's part of uh, the lack of closing that equation. And so some examples that organizations could consider on how to close that equation, if there is going to be a centralized decision-making process, like a DEI office that makes these types of decisions, well, what if the fire service started giving um, either a monetary award or a public recognition or even points towards a future promotional exam to people who were passed up that otherwise would have been promoted based on merit. Um, that's one way to close the loop, even though it's centralized. What Aristotle would say is ideally um, a, a passing off of an opportunity, whether it's hiring or retention or promotion would be between two individuals. So if you and I are going for a promotion, and you scored higher than me, but you thought, hey, you know what? Like this guy G deserves a chance and I'm willing to give up my promotion to G and he meets the minimum qualification. So there's no reason why the organization 
should reject him on its face. I'm going to give my promotion to G. That would be the organic way that equity would occur. And Aristotle would say that's actually the right way. That's the true way that, or, that equity would occur. And what that does is that means everybody who saw that, including the organization and myself, give you the honor in exchange for the fact that you gave up this promotion that you earned. And that could create a lifelong bond between me and you, one of respect, one of friendship, but it could also create a lifelong admiration for you from the department, from your peers, from my peers, et cetera. And so that's the piece of the puzzle that's not actually taking place right now in diversity, equity, inclusion efforts, I think. And so, um, so not only, so you have this one piece, which is we have to be able to assess individuals on their whole person, their body, their mind, and their soul, and not just off of a test score. Um, but the other part of it is, even if you do that assessment, then when you make your selections, and if those selections are in any way, shape, or form subjective that are based off of a minimum standard, we have to understand how to close that loop of equity. And up until now, what I see, what I observe is that that loop, that that entire equation is not being closed. So you're still, you're leaving this space on the equation for people to feel resentful about that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does very much. You know, you, you talk about giving honor. We're both Jewish. We both know what the word tzedakah means. It means, and to translate, it means charity, but it comes from the word tzedek, which means righteous. And that's always been something that once I learned it's the root of it, and it meant so much more to me because when you do a righteous act for somebody, whether it's a donation or you do something like giving up your your promotion to another 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 firefighter, that you feel you know what I can give, I can wait I can take the next exam, let him or her get it. They deserve it. They they really worked hard for this, and I know them. They're good people. They'll make good a good officer. We do the same thing basically with a concept of charity, of tzedakah, because not only do we help somebody when we give that donation, if it's a donation, but we're told that we've done a good deed. And that's part of what our life as Jews is supposed to be about, is doing good deeds. And it doesn't have to mean just money. I mean, uh, you know, for years, even before I was a firefighter, if I saw an elderly person at the supermarket trying to load, move a carriage, load that stuff into the car, I always stop and say, can I give you a hand? And I'll do it. The only difference has been that usually since I wear the, a fire department t-shirt or a jacket, they'll say, oh, you firemen are so nice. You people are so good to help like that. You know what? That wasn't about me. That In that case, that was about the fire service. And that's the honor that the fire service got just by reaching out and helping somebody put groceries into a vehicle. So if we can do that simply, and lots of people from all walks of life, all religions know about charity and the importance of helping others. Not everybody gives. Not everybody reads. Not everybody writes the same way. We don't speak the same way. Everybody has their own personal traits. But most people have learned at some point in their life about charity and that the reward it's not a monetary reward. It's not a big ceremony at City Hall. It's a matter of walking away knowing that you helped somebody else and you did a good and you did something good that day in your life. There's that's why everything you're saying is making sense, because and especially the the, the example you gave about the promotion. That first person firefighter didn't have to give up his or her promotion for the next person. Didn't have to. But out of the goodness of their heart and their loyalty to the department and their family, the second family that we all have, that firefighter backed away and said, "Let let let my comrade, let my colleague get it." That's that's the heart of who we are. If you want to look at it that way. Yeah, and I think um, I think it's fair to say, especially for some of your listeners that are saying, "Okay, gee." Um, that's a nice utopic utopia sort of view on life, but it's never going to happen. And I would say you're probably right. That's not likely to happen. And therefore, um, there are people who would argue that 
uh, organizational, you know, DEI efforts um, are are valid in that there needs to be some sort of um, oversight into how do you build a system, even if it's not going to be completely voluntary or completely organic the way Aristotle might have envisioned it, how do you do that while still um, while still meeting this desire, and how do you do it from a, a management perspective? And I think um, I think you can still there's there's a if you're if you're finding a way to close that equation, you can still um, do the best you can do under management constraints, if you will. And I think one of the most important things to keep in mind here is that. Um, the individual at the individual level, you won't necessarily see how the organization is shaping out with um, with its abilities to uh, to raise the next generation of members. And this is actually where I think the bigger picture of diversity comes into play, which is uh, leadership and essentially the development of other people, the development of the next generation of firefighters is inherently tied to diversity. And that's because if it's, if it's true that humans have a body, mind, and soul or a biopsychosocial construct, then that means you need people that are good in those areas in order to help develop the next generation. And if you only go off of test scores and you don't look at the whole person, you risk the chance of coming up with people who are only good in thinking about something or taking tests on that met, on that mental or mind dimension, and maybe they maybe they lack the ability to develop others in their body or their soul or social dimension. And so, there is an argument for why, at a higher level in an organization, there should be consideration on how to constantly balance out what the organization is taking in, and this is where a whole person assessment and a consideration on whether the department needs to take in more people who are better physically, better mentally, or better socially, um, and, and manage that retention and hiring process and promotional process, because ultimately an organization is just a bunch of individuals, right? So if it's true that the, or the individual has the body, mind, and soul construct, then it's also true that an organization has that same triad it's just manifested at a group level. And if the organization wants to be better physically, mentally, or socially, it has to bring people into the organization that have those attributes that can then lead the organization in that direction. And that's actually why it might make sense for an organization to say, look, we're going to have this minimum standard, but we don't want to just keep continuing to pick people off of the top of this, uh, this, uh, you know, list of test takers because maybe that's only going to get us people who are good mentally sure. but we want to balance the people who are good mentally physically and socially and that would take some effort at, at a strategic level in an organization especially if it's not going to happen organically the way aristotle intended it to happen right that's a good good point but it's it's a, it's a very valid point as well and I, i'll close this first segment with with this and that uh, probably around 2018 or so, on social media, there was a lot of postings and complaints about the new young new generation coming into the fire service, and they don't have this. They don't. They, all they did was play with their games, the Xbox and this and that, PlayStation. And I looked around a little bit, read a bunch of posts on here and there. And then I did a little research, and I came up with a very simple fact. Yes, you may be right. A lot of those kids played a lot of games. And just ask yourself now, who's flying the drones for the U.S. government? Want to look at the age of the people flying the drones? Well, you're going to find people in their mid to late 20s, and this is the generation you're complaining about, because these kids have great eye-hand coordination, and they've been trusted, trusted by the government to run these very important, can be dangerous missions all around the world because of the talent they came in with. 
That's what we have to look at in the fire service too. I came in with no talent, but I was trainable. And I think if there's that passion there in the heart, and again, we talked about this on the phone, is that people don't just become firefighters. It's a calling. It's something you decide to do. And you know, going in, even to apply, number one, may not get in. It's not the cleanest job in the world. It's not the easiest job in the world. And I'm going to see a lot of crap in my life. I'm going to do it anyway. That's the calling. And that's why we're different. But at the same way, we're like everybody else. We're human. We have our frailties. We have our our, our strengths and our weaknesses. We can't just castigate people because they're not exactly like us. We don't create, thank God, we don't give birth to automatons. We give birth to every child. We don't know how that child's going to develop and grow. We talked about our your your youngest and my grandson, approximately only a couple, couple of weeks apart in age, and how they are behaving already and what they know and their abilities at two and a half that my kids didn't have when they were two, my girls didn't have when they were two and a half. And we've seen this development and change. It's the education he gets at the early childhood center, et cetera. And I think that if we can, as a, as a, uh, as a uh, place that looks for people all the time, as a business, that because we are a business, if we open our eyes to what that total the person can donate and bring to our organization, then we're going to be better off because we're going to have better people and people who care about what we're doing. They're not just there for the paycheck. And we know there are lots of people in all sorts of professions, all two types. Ones do it for the, some that do it just for the paycheck. Some do it because they're dedicated to the task at hand. Firefighters, law enforcement, EMS people, this is not a job that, these are not jobs that often pay very, very well. These are jobs that pay routine, and yet we take them, or we volunteer if we're, like on my side. But just to look at a person, maybe they're skinny and don't have many muscles, and you say, ah, they'll never make it as a firefighter. Or that guy's obese. He's not going to make a firefighter. And I think the best example I have for you is I had a call. It was going to be my first time on the nozzle. And I knew the guy next to me. He was voted in the same night I was, but it wasn't my buddy. He didn't make that call. And the captain turned around. He said, Steve, I want you to be on the pull the nozzle. And you, you're going to take out the spaghetti and back him up. And I, we both said, okay. And we looked at each other. We got it? Got it. Good. Came out, grabbed the nozzle, pulled the line. Captain caught me, brought me up to where the, the fire on the seaside was. And started working it. And I'm working it. And the guy in the hose behind me, he's doing great. He's terrific. Taking all that back pressure off me. I mean, we flew. We flowed about, I don't know, seven, eight minutes to knock down. It was a cupboard, kitchen cupboard area fire. Knocked it down. Cap told me to shut it down. Captain gave me a good pat on the back. Said, hell of a job, Steve. Good job. Good knock. And I turned around to say, the friend, the guy who was supposed to be there, he wasn't there. It was somebody else. I said, hi, Thanks. I said to the captain, Where's the, what happened to him? So he goes, go talk with the chief. So I went over to the chief after I took my gear off. And I said, what happened? Is What's his name okay? He says, he's fine. I said, what happened? He was going to pull the line behind me. He goes, when you start to get close, he really wasn't comfortable being that close to the fire. I said, that means you got to throw him out. Huh? He goes, hell no, I'm not going to throw him out. He'll do other work on the fire ground. He's a valuable member of this department. He just doesn't want to do entry into fire. That's fine with me. He goes, he'll be great. He'll do ladders. He'll straighten hose. He'll be fine on the fire ground. I'm keeping it. What better example? Then you have a chief officer who says, I got to take care of my people in the best way I can. You know, nobody was hurt. Thank goodness he was, the kid wasn't hurt. And he, for the next, Three years that I've served with him, he was a great firefighter, great guy, and always 
always on the call. Whether he made the apparatus or not, he just wanted to make sure he was there in case anybody needed him. That's the kind of people we need. And that's the kind of leadership we need. With someone who sees the whole person and not just, is he skinny? Is he fat? Is he muscular? Is she? Can she climb that high? Can she lift this much? I'm tired of that BS. Yes, we have we have to do the CPAS, right? Agreed. You need that, especially today. But we also have to remember that if a person to agree to take this job or be a volunteer, there's the dark side that we have to tell them about also. And that also gives us a measure of who they are. Because when we tell them, you know, if you take this job, you have a 200% greater chance of getting cancer than the people in your house. Okay, Chief, where do I sign? That's what we have to look at. Is how do we get, how do we bring in, attract, bring them in, judge them correctly, work with them, and then help educate them to be the best they can be in that department. That's what we have to do. And I think what you're talking about is probably the very best way we can do it. Now, in the second part, we'll have to talk about how we get departments to buy into that and do it. Because to tell you the truth, I don't think it's going to raise the cost of re retention and recruitment. I think it's going to raise the personnel and good personnel that we need. And yes, will we have to weed out some? Absolutely. But that's with any job. Doesn't matter what the job is. We always you need to weed out people. So, folks, we're going to take a break here. This was a great first segment, even better than we had talked on the phone as we planned it and came out wonderfully. So, if you're watching the video, you're not going to see anything different. If you're listening to the audio, you know we're going to take a little break. We'll have a couple of public service announcements for the fire service, and then we'll be back with our guest, Dr. Gamaliel G. Bear, as we continue to talk about bringing the concept of DEI to the modern needs of especially for us, the fire service, and maybe even our other brothers and sisters, first responders, because they're not doing any better than we are as far as retention and recruitment. So this is something that we can all look at and think about. And tell you the truth, you could take this and apply it to many, many public sector jobs as well. So we'll be right back right after these words. As always, please, please stay tuned. Hello, and welcome back to this episode of Five Alum Task Force. I'm your host, Steve Green. With me, once again, thankfully, is my brilliant guest. He doesn't want me to call him that, but this is the way I see him as we talk. And that is Dr. Gamaliel Bear. And we are talking about bringing a new view to how we bring in, recruit firefighters, and even both career volunteer, part pay, WUI, does make a difference. And these, what we're talking about, could probably be used across the spectrum of first responders, fire, law enforcement, and EMS. We're all in need of people, good people, but sometimes, I guess we could say sometimes the departments wear blinders, and they only see what they want to see, and they don't get the whole picture of the person. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I think what's interesting now, Steve, is um, as we enter in this age of uh, of AI, there's going to be a lot of opportunity here to um, to sort of redevelop whether it's recruiting or retention or promotion opportunities. Um, and you mentioned earlier that you know, robots aren't taking our jobs. <laughs> You know, from what I understand from um, Elon Musk's ideas, that there may be a future where robots do take all of our jobs. <laughs> but but before we get there, um, I think that we're going to have this opportunity to to start using AI in our profession in the fire service, and of course other services as well. Um, and that will sort of like change the way change the landscape of 
recruitment and retention and promotion. And so one, one example of that is um, going back to the, you know, to the body, mind, soul triad. If we assume that members of the fire service have to meet a minimum standard. So, you know, we're ruling out that you're not physically incapable by making you do a CPAT. We're ruling out that you're not psychologically unstable by taking a psychological battery. Maybe we're ruling out that you have the ability to speak clearly at an interview panel, but those are all minimum standards, right? But then when we look at, let's say, for instance, promotion to become an engine driver, um, you know, the part of going through the pumps classes and the testing process is the ability to, uh, you know, be able to do math on the fly, right on the fire ground and be able to count the amount of hoses you have off of the engine, calculate the friction loss for the amount of feet for multiple different size hoses. Maybe it's inch and a quarter, maybe it's two and a half, maybe it's three inches, whatever. And you're doing all this in your head so that you can get the proper, you know, pump pressure so that you can get the proper GPMs out of the end of that hose. Um, well, with the, with AI now, um, you probably, we're probably facing a time now where you can, put AI into the pump panel of a fire truck, a fire engine that does all that calculation for you. And, um, and now we're sort of negating that aspect of having to do math on the fly. And imagine how many more people would at least make the minimum qualifications sure. to be considered for selection to be an engine driver now. Right. So, um, and, and for the, for the naysayers there, you know, when I came into fire service in 2008, we were still being taught on how to read map books. And, um, and that was part of our training. And I'm sure that sounds like way too, you know, late in the game. Probably people from the 70s and 80s are like, oh, yeah, you know, like that was all we had back then. At least in 2008, we had something, right? Well, nowadays, you have the mobile data terminal, the MDT, right? It's like a tough book that sits in the fire truck that tells you where you're going. And if that goes down, you have a phone. So the math books are now the backup to the backup. In fact, some people only use their phone when they're going to a call because it's just faster than the MDT. And so we shouldn't continue to hold somebody's ability on how to read and navigate from a math book as a very large portion of a promotional test, if any, right? right. I mean, it's 99.9% .9 of the time you're either using the mobile data terminal or your phone. In a catastrophic event, maybe you have to use a map book. So I think there's going to be an opportunity to do the same thing with, you know, pump tests on an engine. Um, or even you can think of, uh, I mean, AI is, and these large language models are so advanced now that they're going to be able to look at all of your policy within an organization and you'll be able to ask it what a policy is and get an immediate answer right away. Or think about courses of action. If you're sitting in the chief's buggy, this, these LLMs will be able to give you, you know, what's, what's the first alarm to the scene going to do? Where are they staging? What, what's, the, what's the sort of like automated suggestion of where things should go based on what we know on the scene? Of course, having a human in the loop is important, but it, what these what AI and LLMs are going to do is it's going to reduce the cognitive load that you need to have in the moment and allow you to play with courses of action and decide as a, as a judgment call, what's the best course of action. And that's a completely different way of using your mind yeah. than having somebody recall rote memorization. What is policy X, Y, Z, or, you know, what's the friction loss of five different hoses of different sizes and lengths off of your fire engine. That's no longer where your mind needs to go. Now your mind just needs to be able to make a judgment call. And what that means is we can then um, reduce the requirements for, let's say, or at least um, not rely so much on the requirements for like, um, you know, the mental aspect of a test. And actually, I think what that's going to mean is your physical abilities and your social abilities are going to be more important. How you interact with other people is going to become more important and how healthy you can be and how, like, how able you are on the job to do the job is going to become more important than 
whether or not you can remember something off the top of your head because the AI is going to be prompting you with that. So I think that's just one example of where um, as an organization being able to know what you want and how to balance out your talent in the organization it becomes important because yes, you're going to want people who are good mentally and can do things on the fly. But in the age of AI, if you put all your eggs in that basket, you're going to have a bunch of people who are going to, they're going to be outdone by AI anyway. AI, AI will outdo the smartest mind in math, yes. right? That's just something, AI is not about judgment calls. It's about calculations. And so it's just statistics at scale. That's all it is. And so um, if you put all your eggs in the basket of who can score the highest on your tests and AI cannot do that, and now all your individuals are good test scores, but they don't have the physical ability or they don't have the social ability, you've just sunk your own battleship, right? Right. And this is where diversity becomes an important concept to understand and making sure you have people in your organization that are good socially, that are good physically, and not just good at taking tests and making sure you look for that whole person. Um, and, and again, imagine how many people that would open up the pathway to becoming not just an engine driver, but what about a lieutenant or a chief that now instead of having to remember 50 different policies, you know, you can focus more on dealing with people and becoming a better people person, becoming a better manager, becoming more active, because we all know the chief that can name a policy off of the top of their head, but is terrible with people or can't do the job physically <laughs> anymore, right? Like right. those are two big sort of memes that get brought up when you talk about management. Right, so, right. good point. You know, with, for those people who are as old as I am, and those younger who watch the reruns on TV is emergency, uh, the TV show emergency, which was one of the factors that when I got the invitation to join, that pushed me to join because I really loved what they were doing. Uh, I, I didn't care about the character personalities as much as to see firefighters doing that kind of paramedic work. I was just amazed by that. So one of the things you see once in a while when they get dispatched is Mike Stoker, who was a real driver for LA County, and because none of the actors were allowed to drive county county property, so he, nobody else could drive the truck other than Stoker. Uh, or you'll see uh, uh, Ke Kevin Tig or or uh, Randy Mantooth go over to the big map on the wall, as we had in our department. Uh, our department big map. They got the address and they look at the cross street. Then they get into the rig. Well, that's what we had to do in those days. Uh, we were no different. There were some times that when I was driving the rescue or an engine that I had to go double check the map for where it is. Uh, lots of side streets off that main road. I got to figure out wh where that one is. So the fact is that if you don't, now we have GPS um, in our cars, on our phones. Almost every smartphone that you get today has GPS, one form or another of GPS. Matter of fact, now... Thank goodness. And I think AI is going to take this company to a, a high level with the people. And there were some other companies, but I only know specifically Hass Alert. They have the safety cloud and they put the little, this little device on your light bar. And as soon as your light bars turn on, whether it's a, an engine, it's a rescue, it's a chief's car, whatever, police car, ambulance, it broadcasts to the, cl the safety cloud, which then displays on your infotainment system. So we're not going to need all those necessarily big flashing signs or to get them. We're, how many departments can afford one of those huge flashing signs that needs gas to, to run it and stuff like that? Whereas if you can get the information right now, it's on Waze, um, which was originally, let's not forget, it, originally created in Israel. Um, and now comes up automatically on Waze. And it's coming on to other ones. And some of them are not even are going to go right to infotainment systems. A Stellaris, uh, I think Chrysler, and there was another company that already signed on. But they're putting the signal the, from the safety cloud right on the infotainment system. You don't have to be running a GPS. You're listening to music on your info. You're listening to Sirius XM. On your, boom, that warning is going to come up on your dash that says, uh, caution, accident ahead or fire personnel ahead. Please slow down, bear to the right. That's going to be a lifesaver. And I think now, with AI coming out as much as, as it is, you, they, if Hustler or any company that's doing this kind of work puts AI together with 
their technology, that's going to be a home run to save lives. We already know how many, because of the great people at the Respond to Safety Institute, we know how many people are being struck and injured or struck and killed. And again, far too many of our brothers and sisters throughout the first responder family have died because of distracted driving. And so AI, put together with concepts like the safety cloud, will save lives. I have no doubt about it. If, they, if it can do everything on the pump for us, if it can get us to our location the fastest, safest way, if it, if it can handle other parts of what we need to do that sometimes we have to do manually, but it's going to do it with a push of a button, it's going to change the face of how we're able to do our jobs. And as you said, that brings a different level of people we can bring into it because we've taken some of the most difficult part out of the equation, and now that leaves that space. And we can fill that with good people who are physically able, good, good common sense with them, stuff like that, who may not have been able to handle it the other way, get them onto the department, and there's another member of the family coming on board. Yeah, I mean, another way to look at that, Steve, is if the amount of people that can do the calculations off their head to become a pump driver or an engine driver and, and, and do the pump calculations, if that number, let's say, just hypothetically is, you know, 10% of the department, but within that number, if, if what you're doing is you're sacrificing members who are good people, person, or, you know, or physically strong because you're getting the smart brainiacs that can do the pump calculation. And I'm not saying that's the case, but if that is the trade-off, if you're trading off well-rounded people for people who can do these really elaborate pump calculations off the top of their head, then if you do away with the need for that, and now you can expand that. And, and if now the um, situation becomes that you can take good people that are physically strong and, and socially well adept to working with the team, if that is the trade-off, then that's a good trade-off. Now, I'm not saying that pump drivers aren't physically strong and also good with people. I know a lot that are both. Um, and it's also in the fire service, oh, there's a ton of good people in the fire service. There's, I, I know a lot of good people in the fire service that have the whole package. They're physically strong, they're mentally sharp, they're socially very adept. But as we look at how to increase the amount of possible candidates for any situation, whether it's retention, whether it's recruitment, whether it's promotion. The question is, how do you open up the gateways to increase those numbers? Right. Um, and that's the other thing that AI is going to be able to do as well is help you to sort through numbers if your numbers get to a point where you believe they're unmanageable, because that's, that's always the balance too, is, you know, do you want over a certain amount of um, candidates because is that too many to take care of? You know, there's, there's always a trade-off, uh, and I think AI can play a role there too. But one of the other w ways to open up these pathways in the fire service is the promotional pathway to go from firefighter to an officer. And right now, that pathway is usually pretty narrow for most fire service, most fire departments that I know. Usually it's something like this. You have to take a written exam. If you pass the written exam, then you can do a, uh, an assessment center, whether it's, uh, you know, doing some sort of administrative assessment or um, some sort of fire ground assessment, a simulated fire ground assessment. And then you can do a, uh, a panel interview or something like that, right, or sit down with the chief. But in order to get to that level, there's a subset of requirements that are usually that usually have to be met um, and those include like having some certain college finishing a certain amount of state course state fire course requirements um, and in some departments even going to an officer candidate school and <clears throat> I think when you when we talk about diversity diversity shouldn't just be who's on your poster for your department diversity should include um, and really, in my mind, be more focused about how do you open up the net 
for the most people, regardless of who fills that net. And so what I would like to see, another actionable way of bringing diversity to the fire service is, well, what if you just made three different pathways for firefighters to promote? What if, what if one way was you have, a, you have a minimum amount of college and that meets a requirement? Another way is if you don't want to go to college or can't afford college, you can do these free state courses that are given by your state training program. Or another way could be, hey, you know what? I think I know it because I've studied it on my own in these books. Let me just test out. Let me take this test, right? So that's three, that's actually three different ways that you could verify that somebody has met the minimum standard that you think they would need for the mental side of the you know, of the equation. But in so many fire departments around, most fire departments, usually you have to do all of those to some degree. And it's a very long and narrow road. Think about how many people just don't even try to promote because they don't want to go to college or feel like they can't afford it. They don't have the time or feel like they want to do these state fire classes. And then sometimes that doesn't even allow them to be eligible to sit for the exam, let alone just test out of the exam. If that's yeah, not even an sure. option usually. So um, in the military, you know, they, they're very good at this. They have lots of different ways to become an officer. You can go to college. That's one way. If you're enlisted, you can, um, you can get a degree that they'll pay for you because you're already in the system. Um, and then you can go through some sort of internal officer candidate school. Uh, there's also a warrant officer track you can go into. Um, and... Um, and so there, there's all these different ways that you, that you can, you can go through the academy. So come straight out of high school and go to the, you know, military service academy. And they found a way to like open up their net so that they get as many potential pathways to become an officer. And I feel like that is something that the fire service has not really developed yet, which is having more than one way to become an officer in the fire service. It's usually a long and narrow pathway. And, Every conference I go to, there's always this talk about recruiting and retention, retention and promotion and how they just can't find the numbers. And I think that's partly because they, they're focused on diversity of who is filling positions, but not diversity of how it's being done. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It's very, again, we still, even in 2023, about to go into 2024, we still wear some blinders in the fire service. Um, tools are a great topic about blinders. This tool is the best tool for that. Nothing can replace. We've always had it since the 1950s. We're always going to use it. Well, here's another tool that actually adds to what that had. Oh, no, that can't be any better because this is the best. Have you, tr have you tried it? No, no, but I, I'm looking at it, man. That, that, that doesn't this one is much better. Okay. But you haven't even tried this. What you need, what you could use that one for. Try it there. Try it on one of those cases. You'd use that one. No, I'm not going to bother with it. You have that. You have that closed mind. This is what we have. That means this, that's it. That's what we use and nothing else. We wear those blinders on, uh, for many different topics in this, in this business. And, I wish as many people would do 360s when they first get on the scene than, than wear, blind, wear the blinders. Because if you wear the blinders, there's no way you're going to see a, make a 360. And if you don't make a 360, you don't want to be on the wrong end of not doing a 360. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, yeah, actually your tools... Um idea is that it's a good analogy to uh to diversity so um if you think about uh, a toolbox and you might have um you know wrenches you might have screwdrivers you might have you know hammers or whatever uh the reality is that like usually you want more than just one wrench there's different types of wrenches for the wrench job right yeah. um you know a hammer is not going to do a wrench job um, a screwdriver is not going to do a wrench job. A wrench is needed for a wrench job, but there might be multiple different wrenches. And, and actually, I think this is an interesting point because uh, something that I like to say to people is <clears throat> the diversity 
conversation sometimes focuses around what company the rent should be <laughs> and doesn't talk enough about the fact that you actually need different wrenches regardless of the company, right? Like I can have all Husky wrenches, so that's fine. But if they're all the same wrench, um, you know, or, you know, I can have different company wrenches, Husky, you know, I can have whatever, right? Like, let's just say five different types of uh, uh, wrenches. If it's all the same wrench, it doesn't do me any good for them to be different brands. Right. That's, not, that's actually not what I need. What I need is different wrenches that can do different jobs. Exactly. And uh, same with screwdrivers, same with maybe a hammer or, you know, whatever, some power tools or whatever. And so, you know, the, the same idea with diversity, when you're looking at a, a fire department and you're looking at how to develop the fire department and you're looking at how to develop people, and we realize that there's these three dimensions, the body, mind, soul, or biopsychosocial, um, somebody who's really good at developing your body it may not be the best person to develop your mind. And that also might not be the best person to develop your soul or your social ability, but, you know, but even within those three areas, body, mind, soul, you're going to have somebody who's better at fitness and somebody who's better at nutrition. Those are both on the body side, right? Uh, absolutely. Um, in the mind, you might have somebody who's really good at learning and then somebody else who's really good at, you know, motivation or something like that. Right. Um, or math versus science or math versus verbal, you know, in the social, you might have somebody who's really good at, you know, um, dealing with groups and you might have somebody who's really good at dealing with individuals. You know, there's different skills. And so each one of those sides, you have the major sides, which are the body, mind, soul, and that, that constitutes diversity in and of itself. But then on each side, the body, mind, or soul, each of those can be then sort of um, broken into more specific parts. And that, that becomes its own spectrum of diversity. And that's actually how you end up getting to people who are specialists because they're specialists in one thing, but that specialty only exists on one major spectrum of something, right? And so, you know, when you think of diversity for a fire department, it's important to remember that, you know, if you're just going off of one metric, like, uh, like a test for, you know, how much you know about the topic, you're, you're, you're maybe keeping those blinders on, as you say, Steve, to these other sides of a person which will eventually impact the organization, whether we like right. it or not. Um, and so you have to have that concept of how do you look at the people that we're bringing into an organization, promoting in an organization and understanding whether or not it's actually filling a need for uh, improving or developing our, our ability to do physical things, our ability to think about things mental, and then our ability to interact socially within the department. Um, and I feel like, the conversation for diversity hasn't gotten there yet. We're still focused on what company tools we have in our toolbox, as opposed to making sure we have actually different functional tools, you know, people that can do different things. You know, if a department is all white males, um, you know, that's one issue. And we can talk about why a department wa would want to diversify itself and look like the population it's serving, which I don't think anybody has a problem with on, it, on the surface, right? Like if you're a public service agency, you know, it's good to represent the people that you work with, especially if there's language barriers and things like that. You know, diversity is important there so you can deal with the people that you serve. But at the same time, you can have a representative department that looks exactly like the people you're serving by percentage, right? But if they're all only able to do one thing, right? Like if they're all only a wrench, then it doesn't matter what Exactly. The, the department looks like that's also that's another problem to this diversity conversation that has to be talked about so um, you have to be able to mix those two things together yeah that's that's a great pickup because it just i was thinking of the tool chest right right after i finished saying it and you t picked it up because and the tool i was talking about there was a particular tool that i'm fond of i don't i don't get paid to promote it or something like that but this gentleman has a great tool that um, can do a lot that one of our other tools, more than our other tools can do, because that other tool sometimes needs another tool and wood cribbing to use it. Whereas this tool doesn't need that because it's built into the tool itself. And you can get it different sizes, different lengths, from one that will go into the ring on the back of your tool belt in, uh, when you put on your, your fire belt to a 54-inch bar. But it has more ability. 
that has that it that it can do on its own with one piece rather than having to bring two, three, four pieces to do the job that's intended. So we need to open up our eyes in, in the same way that we're talking about tools to the people. And yeah, you know, when you think that of the community that you serve, who are the people in your community? Do you treat one different than the other because of what part of town they live in or because of their color or their ethnicity or their religion? No, we don't. We look, we just care about caring for the person in our community. That's our job. Take care of those people and their property. Wouldn't the fire department want to do the same thing? Make sure it doesn't have a box, just one box of quarter inch wrenches in it and instead have people who care about community and have a passion for what they want to do and have the the uh, the smarts that's re- the, the the smarts that's required have the attitude that's required have the physical agility that's required and have the passion because to me although it's only an emotion i think this job requires passion um yeah we have a lot of simple calls we have the the uh, frequent flyers we all do we all did even back in my day we had frequent flyers but we don't blame the entire community because we have three frequent flyers that call us up at 2 15 in the morning that they can't get to the refrigerator do we blame the whole community because of that no yeah we gotta take care of val and susan and betty all right yep it's betty on the phone let's go boys all right so that, that happens but that doesn't mean the entire community that you serve are those three people. It's diverse community. Properties are different. How do you do a size up? Well, an apartment building is one thing. What if it's up against a berm in the forest right behind you? You can't get to that three. You can't get a 360. You can get three sides only. You're going to say, well, we don't have to do anything then because can't get the whole thing done. No, we don't do that. We don't throw out the baby with a bathwater to use an old, old adage that my parents used, may the rest in peace. We can't do that. We can't afford to do that. So everything you're saying gives validity to the concept of what's right for us to do for our, our departments and our communities. We want the best out there who have the p- passion and the concern for community and people and are willing to do what it takes and sometimes, sometimes are willing to give of themselves totally to protect or save somebody else. And you can't measure that Please. with any meme. You can't measure that any meter or any test because when it happens, it happens. And you have to remember, we have to remember who that, who made that sacrifice and why. And if you, if you're the chief and you don't think about that with every single firefighter, I don't know if you're a chief because the chief, the first first thing that he or she must be concerned with are the personnel. You have to have faith and trust in those people. Not just because they say, yes, sir, yes, sir. Because you trust that leader, him or her, to guide you. And then they trust you to do what you've learned and to do what you're told. Right. That opens a whole wide wide world of more people that we could bring in. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, I think um, to your point about, you know, caring for the personnel, uh, I think that um, you know, this, this job, this is a unique occupation. Sure is. And um, not everybody wants to do it. You know? So I think what, that's the other, that's a, a, a a good thing that people have to consider when they're looking at uh, diversity, equity, inclusion in the fire service is, you know, you can't force people into a calling, right? You can't force people into desire for a certain career. Um, you know, it's, it's true that right now, at least as it stands today, most nurses are still female. <laughs> it's because, you know, it probably attracts females to be a nurse. There are a lot of male nurses, but it's still majority female. Uh, the fire service is mostly male. I think the last time I checked, it's 4% of 
total female across the board. So um, I think, you know, in certain parts of the country, the highest I've seen is 14% female, but that's likely because, as you mentioned earlier, it's a dirty job. It's a dangerous job. And, you know, I think it's probably more natural for males to go towards those types of jobs. So I think that is a good point about, um, you know, the, the fire service requires a certain type of, of person. You can't force that on people. Um, and, um, and I think for, when you're looking at DEI kind of initiatives, diversity, it, that should be focused on opening up pathways, opening up your net and broadening the net as much as possible while still having a, an agreed upon and transparent minimum qualification, yes. which on, on the whole person, uh, body, mind, soul, which would then allow you to be, once you've, once you've captured that audience, that, that group of people, whether it's for recruitment or retention or promotion, once you've figured out who those people are that fit in that category, that, that allows you to, be, to have more um, subjectivity in who you pick for whatever you want, once you've gotten that crowd, the minimum crowd. But that said, I mean, you know, again, you, you, can't, you can't force people to love a career or to go into a, a direction. And once you've been transparent and set your minimum standards, you know, that is what it is. And, and uh, you have to let the chips fall where they may. And if that means having an all-male recruitment class, it is what it is. If it means having an all-female recruitment class, that is what it is. Uh, and I think that's also another uh, sort of hurdle for the DEI community is that um, this idea of it has to be equal outcomes. Um, you know, there's a logical fa fallacy to that. Like, you know, there's only one chief, right? <laughs> there's only one chief. So you can't have a chief that's, you know, a quarter of everything in your population or whatever, right? Like that's just not going to happen. I mean, may maybe, <laughs> maybe there's somebody who's, comes from a mixed family background that might fit that, you know, it's a very rare situation. Um, and so what you have when you have one position is you have to find the best person for the job, but logically that extends out, you know, what do you do for deputy chiefs? What if you only have two positions? It's the same thing, right? It's, sometimes there are restrictions on how many seats are available for a selection process. And so based on that, you can't always have equal outcomes. That's just, that's a fallacy that exists in the DEI conversation that isn't always possible. And that extends all the way down to, op to entry level recruitment and retention. And I think that's another hurdle we have to get over in this conversation of in the broader conversation of DEI in the fire service, which is equal outcome when it comes to promotions, when it comes to rare, uh, rare things like a selection, it's not always possible. Now, equal outcomes for your uniforms, that makes a lot of sense. You know, if you're small, if you're short, you should be able to get a uniform that fits you. If you're tall, if you're big, you should be able to get a uniform. That type of equal outcome makes a lot of sense. But when it comes to selection processes, that becomes a little bit harder. My opinion. Well, I, I think, you know, this, this would be a place for us to close. I think we've really covered this topic that I really never thought about until we talked this afternoon. Um, and now my eyes are open to this. I think it's very important. Uh, we know that the fire service, all branches of the fire service and other first ones are making strong inroads to bring in more people. And I think that if we can convince a few to start with, to understand what we've discussed today and say, you know what? This could be right for our department. We should think about this and look at it. If we can do that, we're success this podcast has been success successful. If people who watch it and listen to it bring the idea to their officers and their chief, that's a good that's a good outcome from this podcast. Will we make major changes? I don't think this little podcast is going to make major changes, but I think that people who know that our our purpose here, I've always seen our purpose is to share education, to share learning. And I hope that 
those who do watch this or and listen to this will take take this to heart understand it and say oh let's talk with our officers or our chief about it this might be a new way to get more people so we're not working double shifts all the time and you know we're not having to do this all the time because we'll have more personnel to help us out and well, more, that means more personnel in the firehouse means more personnel making sure we get all our seating done on every apparatus. We're not going to be shorthanded on an apparatus. And again, you know, 80% of us work in suburban suburban departments, meaning we we uh, we don't have the big urban support. Lots of stations, lots of apparatus, lots of personnel. We don't have that. So in our suburban settings, we need good personnel, good people that we can learn, know and trust, and there will be good firefighters, medics, police officers, whatever they choose to be, because we've given ourselves the opportunity of bringing in the best by opening up our eyes a little bit and saying, you know what? Yeah, we need to look at the whole person and not just that piece of paper. If we, if we get one officer who does that to start, then we've definitely been successful. It only takes one sometimes, right? Absolutely. Gee, I can't thank you enough. Um, you turn this around in my head and for this podcast and made it so importantly relevant to the fire service and to our other branches. And you know what? It should be that really in every job too. Look at the person and what they bring. Now, yes, not everybody's going to come with passion to a particular job. This job, as we, you and I have both mentioned, it's a calling and it's a passion that we have. But there are other great jobs out there. And people, people, hiring people should look, HR should look at the whole person, the composite, not just the one page. And they may learn something about the, that applicant if they look at the whole, the whole, the whole person and not just the single page, and say, "Whoa, they'd be good for us." So, my thanks, my sincere thanks. I'm taking time from a very busy business and family schedule, and uh, spending time joining us today. I really do appreciate it, and uh, I know we'll be talking again. Not too distant future. I want to keep track of where this whole idea is going because I love it now. You, you got me you got me turned on to it. So, folks, if you're watching the video, this will be the end. If you're watch, listening to the audio, we'll be back uh, right after these uh, the next few words with a few more uh, items. And then we'll be back uh, next week with our guest is going to be Peter Matthews, the editor-in-chief of Firehouse Magazine and the director of what I think is going to be called Fire Fusion which is replacing the uh, Firehouse Expo. So that should be interesting to talk with Peter as well. Gee, thank you so much again for spending time with us and giving us a topic that we've never covered, but now ranks right up as one of the most important things that I've learned about and I've had on the podcast. So thank you for that as well. It means a lot to me personally, not just as a producer and podcaster. So I thank you for that. Stay safe and stay well, my brother. Thanks, Steve. Okay, we'll be in touch. And uh, yeah, folks, thank you for tuning in. We really do appreciate it. Make sure you take care of yourselves. And take care of those around you. And uh, let's make sure everyone goes home. Thanks. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.